Um, my name is Georgina Miller. Um, I, I'm a, a competitive freediver and uh, a freediving instructor trainer. I work down at uh, Quasity Freediving, which is at Porth Kerris down in Cornwall, um, all the way on the Lizard. Hello and welcome to the Big Scoop podcast. My name is Ian. On Zoom, I've got Gemma. This is episode 190. Yes, welcome. Well, welcome to the Big Scuba podcast. You sound very tuneful there. Well, you know, it's Monday morning. Let's do this. Let's get the <laughs> week started as we mean to carry on. Um, yes. So coming up, we have an ev- another uh, guest for you uh, who has been on before, but in another form when we used to do little big chats back in COVID days. Yes, 2020. So we spoke to Georgina Miller, who's yeah. a champion, a UK champion freediver. Yeah. And- based down in Cornwall at Porth Kerris. Yeah, and uh, well known, and so is her uh, training centre down there and partner, Dan Fearhoff. Yes, he's an underwater photographer and a freediver and gets some amazing snaps, yeah. Yeah, so right from the top, let's tell you, these episodes are brought to you by the lovely people at Narked at 90. They are beyond technical, you know. Yes, they they are. And it would be really helpful if you could follow their Facebook and Instagram accounts. They right now, right now they're on 437 followers. I just looked right. (laughs) This is the 4th of November. Come on, you Facebookers. Uh, You know who you are or are. Um, Everyone's on Facebook these days. And most divers, uh, especially, you know, those of a certain age are always on Facebook. Right. So get make sure you're following not at 90 because they got hacked a while ago. So you can't let these hackers win. No. So let's get them some more followers. Let's get them over. Let's, let's say, right, let's get them over 500. Come on, let's get them over 500. And uh, and then we can look at the next step of pushing that figure even further because they used to have thousands. Yeah, we can give you an update in the next episode. And they're they're bringing out more information. They've got a blog page now that's really interesting. Videos. So, yeah, yeah. So really good to follow them and keep up to date. With John what... had something going on with a laser. What was that? It looked like some new piece of equipment. Yeah. It's some, uh, some news coming out. So something that's happening. Yes. Yeah. They're they're always doing something, these guys, and um, you know, coming out with something new and uh, maybe tweaking something, especially a few tech divers and rebreathers, uh, people, you know. So yeah, make sure you're following Nart Tech 90. Let's get their let's get their Facebook figures up. Yes. Be up. Come on. See up. what we can do as uh, yeah. the diving okay. community. And their blog. You know, they you know, as Gemma said, so uh, make sure you're following that and make sure you're following us if you're not already. <laughs> you're not, why aren't you? Come on, yes, you make it a productive time on your social media Facebook, the big scuba, and knocked at 90. Yeah, yeah, they go hand in hand. Uh, what have you been up to then? Well, we had a little trip to Stony Cove uh, last week, didn't we? On Tuesday, I was just like turning into my second home up there. Well, you've been there quite you know, twice quite this week. <laughs> Well, three three times in the last week, I've been I've been to Stony. <laughs> three times. Well, yeah, three days. Oh, three days. Yes, yeah. So we had a trip up Tuesday. Um, we took scuba honey, and yeah. so it was really just to get in the water, and just have a a bimble about. And we did a bit of SMB practice, all three of us, which was yeah. very good. Yeah. And took the Olympus in, took the Insta three sixty in. So just to get some footage underwater and the visibility was pretty good, wasn't it? It was until Saturday morning when we stirred it all up again. Well. But hey, <laughs> if you're there this week, it's, it's good viz. It is, uh, and um, I hear, you know, uh, people on the advanced course this weekend had a good time down at Stangarth. In fact, I, when I came up yesterday, um, I could hear some people saying, oh, there's nine people down on the Stangarth and there's another 10 now going down. You know, so as the stain garth was the place to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we saw um, a big pike, didn't we? Tuesday, we did yeah, one of the big ones, yeah, yeah, and a that's perch. Got be, that's got to be a good twenty-five, thirty pound. I'd say that pike. I'd say it's arm arm's length. Good that, I, I, I good that, and that's got a big 
sort of head on. And I know Honey found it quite amusing how his eye kept flicking and uh, looking at it, uh, looking at her. Yeah, yeah. So we had a dive over to the Gresham, didn't we? And yeah. we went yeah. to see Nessie in the <clears throat> underwater box thing. It's Look. quite dark under there. Uh, at the minute, you know, with all the building works going on, and um, yeah. it's notes to be quite dark. But it's all good practice. With it is, you do need a torch. You do really want a torch under there, really. Yeah, and then we, um, yeah, looked at the cockpit, and we went down the road a little bit, didn't we? Yeah, there's sort of quite a few crayfish. So quite a few crayfish at the weekend as well. Did you? I didn't see any cheese. Yeah, you got to keep your eyes open. <laughs> well, you thought it's got your head on the floor. Or something. Well, you know. <laughs> But yes, find, it's... finding that horizontal position, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the um, temperature was what? 12 uh, about f- 12, 13 degrees. I yeah, think. maybe a bit more. About four, I think about thirteen, something like that. I think we got yesterday um, because I was on paddy open waters yesterday um, on the last dive. We got a bit deeper. Um, I think I reached 15, I think, mm. and that, that's down at 12, 12 yeah. degrees down there. Yeah. But and the visuals, yeah. I tell you, the visuals are still good because mm. even though uh, going along there by along the wall there, where the um, where that old chassis, and if you go a bit further, you've got the Wessex and whatever, um, you know, it's easy, even though I weren't at the bottom, um, you could easily see the bottom, mm. uh, you know, really good. So, uh, it's a good time. Good time to do yeah, any courses. Yeah. Uh, good time to be jumping in. You know, so many people uh, don't dive over the winter. And, um, you know, it is really good time, really. Yeah. And I think last year we had good fears about this time of the year, didn't we? Mm, yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah, I'm looking forward to going back. So hopefully yeah. we get back. And we learned something Tuesday, didn't we? Did we? Remember? Oh, yes, we did. Um, so Stony Cove... Clocks have obviously changed in the UK, so we've um, gone back an hour yeah. just just because of daylight. Way back, way back in time. Way back. Um, so on a weekend, you have to be out of the water at three o'clock, yes. but in the week you have until four o'clock, and we yeah. discovered that. Who knew? <laughs> I Who know. Knew? So it's really good because at, right through the winter, you'll basically get a dusk night dive if you're in the water three o'clock onwards. I asked some instructors yesterday who I won't, I don't need to name them, but they've been diving. They're well known, right? Been diving at Stony for years. You know, I've been there, what, nearly 10 years. None of us knew. No. Although there's a board and I just, I just presume the board just stays there, you know, uh, and they've just never updated it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really good, isn't it? So we actually got out of the water just before three on Tuesday, and we could have had another hour. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so next time we go in the week, hopefully that'll be over the Christmas period. And Stony yeah. Cove, I think there's a marketing thing there. You should be shouting to people, go, hey, people. Because actually, like t- today, it's going to be getting dark. So if you're listening to this in June, all right, you probably don't, you know, kind of bear with me, but we're, we're recording this in November. Uh, in the UK and today it's going to be getting dark at sunset it's about 4.30 or something yeah so, it's it's really I was looking so at you this can actually you know it's a good time to actually work on some uh, to go there in the week when it's kind of nice and quiet and um, you know you can work on some night dark skills mm. and what have you yeah yeah. So get the torches good. out and especially for kids and that it's great you know mm. yeah so there we go. So you look up Stony Cove if you've not been there. Have a look. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's a great place to go train and um, great facilities. Got Nemo's Cafe and, um, you know. Uh, good shop as well. Yeah, good that? shop. And, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, good facilities, good place to go work on skills, really. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so that and then you've been back there this weekend on Dive Master Duty with Crystal Seas, our local dive centre. Weekend goes really quick, and it's a busy, busy weekend. So there's uh, my group with uh, Trudy and Polly helping out yesterday, and uh, there was Darren and Nick on Advanced, um, and everybody done really well. Everyone passed. It was really good. Mm. Um, you know, and like I said, water conditions were really good. 
Um, and it, I, I say there's a few things actually. So before I get to that, I'll just do a quick shout out to, because I saw Jimmy from Dive with Jimmy on James, Saturday. James, yeah. Uh, Jojo, she was there, but I, 100% that was her. I got me. And it was Jojo. Oh, it was. It was <laughs> so like, Joanna oh, Wybrick. Next um, time I should make sure I go and uh, say hello. And uh, boy, Dan, Wheels Dan, uh, saw him. He was there all weekend doing deep stuff by the looks of it mm. so uh down at hydrobox i think by yeah and like. you said it was really busy saturday but not as busy sunday no no sunday is definitely quite a day uh i would say yeah, saturday that was as busy as what it is usually in the in the summer actually yeah. um good yeah. people are diving and you know we do dive all year round in the uk we do and and, and like um uh, it was quite clear i i think on from my uh, experience at the weekend about fitness as we get older you know because you know if you're getting into diving and if you're carrying on diving diving is your sport and you want to do more you know fitness does come into play mm -hmm. a lot at, for all of us um and because you know the uh you know most weights the weights are heavy aren't they they um, are yeah the if youngsters you... they're probably up here eight to ten kilos um you know then you've got the dry suit and things like that and it is quite a weight and so you know and fitness really does come into especially when you start getting to the other end where you're like in your 40s and 50s and beyond you know and maybe you haven't done anything about fitness yeah thinking about getting in a dive in or you're new to diving you know and you over the winter if you're not thinking about really getting in the water much because of the cold or whatever um two points one you know look at your skills think about you know how you're going to get if you're not going to get in the water over the over the winter how are you going to practice your skills? You know, you can, use, you can get in the pool in an indoor yeah. pool, definitely. Like and we've done that. Just and to... maybe it's worth doing, booking up it some is. time. Yeah, you know, uh, dry suit. If you haven't done your dry suit spec yet, go you know, speak to your dive centre. You know, get dry suit qualified. Whether you're BZAC, Paddy, SSI, whatever, you know, the agency don't matter. But if you haven't learned how to dive in a dry suit yet, do it yeah. because then you can dive all year round. Yes, yeah. And what's better than getting in the water and coming out dry? Yeah. The whole point of a dry suit. But, you know, if you're used to diving in a wet suit, it's it's just a whole new experience. And you... Yeah, I didn't see anyone there with, in wetsuits, I don't think, yesterday. We did Tuesday, Saturday. didn't we? Yeah, Tuesday. Mm. It's doable, you know, because I think if, you, if, you, if you're not going particularly deep and, you know, you're pretty hardy soul yes. and, you know, you're not going to be in there all that long, you know, the swimmers are all there. Yeah, yeah, they're in their swimmer. Red Raw, but they, they were there <laughs> over the weekend. Crazy fools, but, yes. you know, it's doable. Yeah, still. and then going back to fitness, if you're not going to get in the water over the winter, do you have a think about, doing some activities whether diet, it's yeah at your diet, what you're eating drinking over the winter uh i know christmas is coming up you know but and it is harder as you get older yeah definitely. but it's just it's common sense to but, look yeah. after yourself so that you're in a position once it comes to diving you can take on the weights and you've got some cardio fitness there as well you know yeah. it, is, it is important um yeah. We were, with, we were with somebody and I think that came as a bit of a wake up call that maybe fitness had left this person over the course mm -hmm. of the years. And then now had a bit of a wake up call that actually they want to do dive and that actually fitness does come into play quite a bit. You know, I'm not saying you have to be an athlete, but you do need to be fit yeah. and able basically. Yeah. 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 And this, things get a whole load diff more difficult. Um, yeah. Just makes life easier. It does, doesn't it? And and helps cut the risks. Yes. You know, yeah. Of um of something going wrong. So yeah. and we're here to enjoy diving, not to have it being a task and a, you find it hard. But generally, generally, you know, um, you know, as we get older, it's not good to be heavy. You know, you only got to look at 
sports people and um, listen to a doctor's advice these days as you get older think about that sort of thing so it's not just about diving but in general so and especially with us you teaching mm. you know, you've got med hse medicals we've got to get through and things like that yeah you know, they've all got their limits as well yes. so. yeah and it doesn't have to be you know like running a marathon even just getting out and doing your ten thousand steps it's just and can i just say I'm not saying it in, I hope we don't come over in the lecturing way. I'm talking from experience. <laughs> I love my food. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying. Yeah, but if you've got any comments about dive fitness, point it our way because we're always interested. Or, you yeah. know, what you do over winter if you don't dive, how do you keep your fitness up? So, but, yeah. you know, we're into our gym, our swimming, our running, our CrossFit. So that's, it's all like variety to, yeah, make yeah. it interesting and fun. Yeah, so it's been a busy period over the last uh, couple of weeks since we last spoke to you. Um, we haven't been paddleboarding, have we? So uh, no, we need to. That we probably it's a long nice. while since we've been yeah. paddleboarding. But then the weather's been pretty rubbish, but it has calmed down now, hasn't it? So yeah, still yeah. calm, not windy. I day. think diving off our sh- off our coast has probably come to an end. It off looks our, like it off our east coast. Although yeah. the, the 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 sea has been quite calm. Has still been quite brown underneath, and with the with the uh, current. Still yeah. Up, Although so. the south coast, they're still diving. One of our friends, um, cave crawler Dave, he's been out off Portland. Is he? Yes. Yeah, and they had um, up to six meters visibility. Oh, so jammy. Yeah. So, so jammy. Yeah. So he's. That's all down the south coast. Yeah, he actually put some pictures up. Um, today or yesterday and yeah amazing he's very much into his photography as well he is he is yeah yeah Yeah. right should we uh, get our guest on yes yeah so we have a really entertaining chat with georgina miller about free diving and uh, she was previously a scuba diver and still does scuba dive but free diving is her main um and it's accessible to anyone as well which is great as well yes yeah and it's a beautiful part of the world as well if you if you if you haven't been to cornwall sounds like you need to go you know it's a it's a great place to uh visit yes and we visit on the get... point most south- southerly point yeah and we're hoping to get down there at some point one summer and do this free diving course at some point get to the point exactly <laughs> so is that the point we should carry on no well i think it's a point where we should talk to georgina at the point <laughs> Right, so this is episode 190, and this is our conversation with Georgina Miller. Here's the point. So welcome to the Big Scuba podcast, Georgina. It's great to have you on. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, My name is Georgina Miller. Um, I'm a a competitive freediver and a a freediving instructor trainer. I work down at uh, Quasity Freediving, which is at Porth Kerris down in Cornwall. Um, all the way on the lizard um and yeah really brilliant to talk to you <laughs> excellent that's great to have you on and we have spoken to you back in 2020 on one of our youtube uh, channels we did a little big chat with you <laughs> when we couldn't see people or we were very restricted to what we could do but it's really good to have you back on the podcast and yeah. we can get into a bit more in depth um about you and yeah what you do down in cornwall Brilliant. Yeah. So, so first question is then what does being underwater mean to you? What does diving mean to you? Well, that's an interesting question. And I think it sort of like slightly depends on the, the day or, or, or your mood. Even. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think one of the things that I love about, about scuba diving and free diving actually, both because I do both what well, I, I should say did. I, I used to work as a scuba instructor before I started freediving. So it's kind of, they're a little bit difficult to balance, but it's mostly freediving now, but I still, I still love the, the scuba side of things as well. So um, what does it mean to me? I think one of the nice things about it is that there's a bit of something for everyone and, mm. and there's a bit of something for you, depending on the day. I love, I love um, being underwater and I love exploring and I love seeing the wildlife, but I'm also really, really interested in the competitive side of freediving. It's just, it's a fascinating journey. It's a very personal one, um, but it keeps you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, it, it's, there's a, I do a lot of training and, and I still love that side of it as well. So I think it's a bit of both really, but mm. it's definitely a place where you, sort of lose your edges a little bit 
and and you become well i i i can speak for myself but i sort of feel like the most connection to 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 everything down there so um you kind of the you know you don't have this kind of incessant chatter yeah. <laughs> underwater it's just it's a beautiful mm. place to be it's quiet and and it's involved and yeah. yeah it's just lovely i think um it's just really good for you isn't it it's good for your yeah. soul <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely yeah so what made you take your first so scuba breaths underwater and then how did it go into free diving and then lack of breath <laughs> yeah <laughs> to one extreme to the other <laughs> yeah. one extreme to the other um i think i i felt i was really lucky in that i started scuba when i was quite young so I think I was 17, 16 mm. or 17, and I took a, a BSAC sport diver course. Nice. And it took a, a really long time to get into the water. But by the time we were, we, I, I did it with my sister. Um, we were, um, I remember the first dive that we did was at Stony Cove. Wow. <laughs> I remember looking, like looking at the light beams coming, I think there's like a, you have to forgive me because I haven't been there for a long time, but I think there's like a building that overhangs. Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's, like, it's like a concrete box type thing, it feels like. Yeah. Like big yeah, windows so in I still water. remember sitting in like sitting underneath it and looking at the light rays passing through, just thinking, This is beautiful. This is yeah. absolutely beautiful. I love it. And um yeah, so I, I think I, I, I became a scuba and I sort of went, worked my way up to instructor and became an instructor in 2000. Um, and I got to travel to some really nice places doing that. Um, and then I guess freediving, I didn't really realize it was a sport <laughs> until, mm -hmm. I mean, we used to, we used to kind of do a bit of freediving you know, when I when I was away working with with scuba, but I didn't really know what I was doing. You know, it was kind of who could get the biggest rock from the bottom. <laughs> I mean, it was like completely unhinged stuff that we were doing without any kind of education behind it. And um, I saw a, a lady out in Thailand swimming with a with a monofin on, and she was pretty deep. Actually, we were we were on a on a deep. I said deep wreck, it wasn't deep, deep, it was 30. <laughs> but I remember seeing her swim past and just thinking, wow, <laughs> I want to do that. I want to, I want to give that a try. And looked into it and found out that it was an actual, it was an actual sport that you could learn. And um, I took my first course in 2007. Wow. And um, so I've been free diving for quite a long time now, I guess it makes me a free diving dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and then I think I started competing pretty quickly um, in that. And I think it was a very different sport at the time. It was much, much smaller. Um, and I just found the people to be really like, really supportive and really kind of friendly and encouraging. And, you know, there was no kind of, th there was never any like need to perform with it. It was just like, you mm -hmm. know, just fun really. So that's kind of where it started. And um and I kind of increasingly, I think I got interested in the training side of it. And, and I, I thought for a long time that I just wanted to focus on training freediving and, and that would be it. But the more you do it, the more you realize that community is really central to everything that you do, both scuba mm. and freediving. It's all about the people. And so I think that was why I, I, I did a freedive instructor course because, yeah, really it's about kind of building community and, and uh, you know and and and, and being around like-minded people yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah yeah were you did you feel you were a natural when you started free diving because some people are you know naturally good at or is it something that has got it's it, the training that you know makes you more and more I think it's a bit of both I mean like you know, when, when you when you teach free diving, you really see like a huge spectrum of people come to this mm -hmm. and everyone starts from a different place. I'm not sure I believe in natural talent. I think that's something that mm, that's a little bit tenuous, but definitely if you're if you've done a lot of, for instance, scuba diving or snorkeling and you're happy being underwater um, and, you know, you've kind of 
you've made a start with at least getting comfortable or you're a strong swimmer or a surfer or something like that you mm. start from a very different place to somebody who's never put their face in the water before yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that it makes one person a natural and one person not but I think that some people have you know um they're on to an easier time of it when they when they first <laughs> learn if they've if they've done some water sports before yeah definitely that makes sense yeah yeah and then the rest of it is about training and hard work um and I think now one of the things that's really changed about free diving since since I started when it was kind of like it was quite a small sport and <laughs> like a little bit of a hippie vibe <laughs> do you know what I mean I was sort of saying oh yeah you can get deeper if you relax more <laughs> you kind of think, oh, I'm quite relaxed like I I, I like being down here I, I don't I don't know there seems to be something missing but like now I think they're much better at um understanding that you, you know like the there's much more to equalization on free diving than just oh relax more and you'll get deeper it's you know mm. there's a lot of technical stuff around it and there's a lot of technical stuff about how to train properly to yeah. um, you know to get better at it really quickly so i think the the information wasn't really there when i started free diving mm. now it's really really developed um and it's becoming a very kind of different different beast really but um mm. in a good way i think <laughs> well, i suppose the uh, the hardest is the hardest thing about it is the breath hold no i don't think so i think most people um find that they will surprise themselves in terms of how long they can hold their breath for um with the right techniques um you you know you think oh people think oh i could i couldn't do more than 30 seconds or something <laughs> but actually once you start to understand the science and you have a few good breathing techniques behind you you can you can improve that really quite dramatically quite quickly I think the biggest limiting factor for most people is equalization. Mm. Okay. Um, so unlike scuba, um, the Valsalva really doesn't work very well. And that is the most simplistic one to explain, isn't it? Just pinch and blow. <laughs> but it doesn't really work for free diving. Um, so kind of having to having to learn a, a, a completely different technique that doesn't necessarily come naturally um, can be, I think, the the limiting factor for for most people, certainly when they're learning. Mm. There's a few people in the world that equalize so well that they're concerned with other things now, but I'm definitely not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my deepest dive has been 70 meters. Oh. And that takes just a little over two minutes. So it's not a particularly long breath hold and it's not a particularly long distance to swim, but the equalization is difficult with that. Mm -hmm. And is that going down as well as coming back up? Yeah, 70 metres down, 70 metres up. Yeah, and but the equalisation, is that adjusting as you go down and then adjusting when you come back up? Is it kind of a mirror? It's, it's uh, similar similar to scuba. You don't need to equalise on the way up because it, it's about um, increasing pressure that, mm -hmm. you need to, that you need to balance. Um, so the way up is pretty easy. It's just like, just feels like a little workout. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way down is is definitely the the most kind of subtle part though um without wanting to get kind of too technical about it because you're um the air spaces are shrinking mm. inside your lungs when you're and inside your mouth when you're free diving it's not like scuba where you have like sort of air being pushed at you so it's there's a lot to play with kind of thing it's yeah. all shrinking so you have to kind of be able to master your mouth parts <laughs> to be able to put everything in the right place. Um, and it starts to become quite hard to move air out of your lungs and up to your up to your mouth and nose in order to equalize once you go past sort of 30 ish meters, it starts to become a very different, very different beast there. Mm, it's very interesting. Let's say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is, it, I suppose if you um, you know, we you hear of like star some of these stars that get trained to breath hold, at, and so they can do certain scenes underwater and things like that. And I suppose there isn't a much change in depth depth with that. And I suppose no. they are, you know, holding their breath at let's say five to ten meters, maybe around about the five meters to, you know, to do a camera scene and what have you. And then 
but that's going to be different if you're dropping down to depth. You know, and that hadn't occurred to me like that. You know, mm -hmm. after thirty meters, how much you know um, your air cavities and that are going to shrink? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> but I mean, I think the sort of, um, I think the kind of movie star sort of, you know, things that happen. A lot of that is done on en enriched air. So they're they're breathing uh, different mixtures of gases, and they're they're breathing from scuba tanks, and then able to hold their breath for a bit longer without um, without having the same kind of mm. yeah. training behind them. Um, and most of it's happening inside the the studio tanks, which are what four or five meters deep, I think. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a that's a little bit of a different beast, but oh, I still yeah. have like massive respect for them because can you imagine being not being a diver or a water person and then suddenly being told that you have to learn how to hold your breath for five minutes and, and be underwater. It must be terrifying. <laughs> yeah. We've heard some, we've, uh, we have heard some funny stories about some of the famous actors um, of behind the scenes stuff. And, um, divers. Is, divers. Um, there was a certain James Bond crying <laughs> in the corner. Uh, oh. <laughs> which... Did Andy Torbett tell you that? No, we interviewed no. Uh, Mike Valentine, who's an underwater video and photographer. And uh, yes, he was full of... This James Bond's no longer around anymore. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> but I was crying in the corner, apparently. Oh, well, I mean, it would be, you know, it would be really like... Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Really difficult for people that have no sort of... You know, can you imagine if you'd never put your face in the water before or you weren't a particularly strong swimmer mm. to, be, to be told that... I think to be told to hold your breath is one thing, but breathing yeah. underwater, I mean, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. And this is the same uh, actor, actually, that um, very fake. I don't know if how well known this was, but when he, they were filming um, Dr. No, uh, the shark was in the pool because there was the glass one side, shark yeah. was one or the other, actor the other side, and all was fine until the shark realised that the glass didn't go all the way. <laughs> and got behind <laughs> oh yeah yeah and he had to make a run make a sharp exit oh my and gosh what, what, yeah, I bet yeah. the health and safety executive well, loved that, was all that. that that was all way before that. <laughs> yeah yeah the shark yeah. realized that yeah that could actually get behind the glass um, oh my god wow that's incredible <laughs> yeah. so i just thought when you're descending say to 50 70 meters are you physically feel what are you physically feeling about the pressure on your body is it a sensation of some kind i think if you're if you're equalizing well um you don't feel any pressure it's not like that kind of people always think gosh you must feel like you've got incredible like an elephant sitting on your chest or something it's really not like that it's actually it's all very kind of balanced. Um, if you're kind of relaxed with it and you're, and you're equalizing well, there's really no difference between the feeling at six meters as there is at 60 meters. It's exactly the same. So um, yeah, I mean, it's actually quite a, it's, a, it's kind of, it's a weird sport in a way because it's slightly counterintuitive in that you're in an extreme environment for sure. Like this is, the ocean is, you know, as you as you guys know being divers it's you know you've got to be treated with ultimate respect mm -hmm. but it's not really an extreme sport in that it's it's much more to do with relaxation and and being still i love being good at a sport that involves lying down <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? it's brilliant i'm, I'm training <laughs> so it's um yeah, the, the the deep diving, it's 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 more it's like a it's a real exercise in concentration. The mental side of it's very interesting to me. I think it's you know, um, you come to it very progressively though. So it's I think unlike scuba actually, where whereby beginner divers can put themselves into a situation that is really quite challenging or quite potentially quite dangerous very very easily with mm -hmm. you know without the right support or training whereas freediving doesn't really work like that as much if you're not very comfortable down there you're just not going to get there <laughs> so it it really is a kind of a you come to it very progressively and you know baby steps kind of thing so mm. it's not like you know on the on the 
second or third day that you've been trying this that anyone's going to expect you to hold your breath for five minutes or dive down to 50 meters <laughs> it's, so i suppose um, could you not go past your limit where then you haven't got enough breath to get back for a new for a newbie free diver it would be very unlikely as i said the breath hold um the breath holds are usually the easy bit the the distance you swim is also the easy bit yeah. the more difficult bit is to do with um is to do with equalization so if you're not relaxed and you're not sort of um feeling strong down there then i think you probably wouldn't get there so yeah. it's um it's unlikely i think that you'd run out of puff as it were <laughs> it's um it's you know slightly to do with the to do with the science behind it as well um you very rarely see people having problems with low oxygen levels at depth normally it's happening as they come back to the surface wow. so um and that's to do with the sort of the, the physics and the, and the physiology. What, narcosis? Oh, well, that's a that's an interesting one because theoretically, the kind of narcosis that you experience on scuba is very related to nitrogen, right? Yeah. Mm. And but but free diving is different because we're down there for such little time. Comparatively, it's more like a, a bounce. It's extremely quick. So nitrogen loading isn't quite the same, really. So what you CO two. Well, that is that is definitely something that you would pro probably start to come into play with with the deeper dives. Yeah. I think um, CO2, CO2 narcosis also because it's to do with workload. So as people come back up to the surface, unlike nitrogen narcosis, where it starts to sort of fade away and it gets easier, yeah. this becomes more uh, more of a challenge. So I think that CO2 narcosis is a difficult thing for some of the deep divers to contend with. And mm. I'm at what point does that happen is a little bit difficult to say. I right. think judging by the fact that it's so difficult to concentrate <laughs> when you're when you're at depth. And if somebody said to you, Oh, what did you do wrong down there? You'd be like, Oh, I'm not sure, actually. And it's really kind of, um, it's a really overwhelming feeling like, but this, the 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 CO, CO2 narcosis for the seriously deep divers is it can be very kind of like hallucinogenic they can lose memory they lose track of time there's yeah. lots going on but i think that you know i'm talking about like the 100 meter plus people mm. that yeah. um that are experiencing stuff like that so i'm i don't know i feel like i'm probably maybe not completely lucid, but also not kind of freaking out down there or anything. Still. <laughs> and then I, it feels very different to nitrogen narcosis, which is quite, um, it happens quite suddenly, right? And it can make yeah. you feel really quite giddy and, and um, it's really difficult to concentrate. This is a bit more vague, I think. Yeah. So I, for me, it's not something that's necessarily a, a huge problem. Um, but I think for some of the deep divers, it's it's oh. it's a thing. Yeah, um, I, bet. I guess it's just people their decision to push their limits, isn't it? Yeah, and I think I think what what's limiting them is often very different as well. I mean, as I say, most people are limited by equalization, but some of the people that are the diving the very very deepest in the world are limited probably by narcosis or or how they how they handle that. It's I don't. I think the hypoxic side of it, like the low oxygen side of it, is probably um, more manageable and more trainable. And there are other things coming into play. Um, I think another thing that seems to be happening now more often is that freedivers are suffering from DCS as well. Right. Whereas when I started, they, <laughs> you're, like, you're really not particularly concerned with it. Um, I think sometimes... We'd, we'd heard reports about, you know, spear fishermen who were spending all day in the water, r repeat dives to 15 or 20 meters and do that for a week mm. might be at risk. But now the the, the deep free divers are experiencing um, symptoms. So what it, what the root cause of that is, is still a little bit. Because I read that there was sure. in some report, I can't remember what 
what who thing it might have been Dan um, a couple of years ago that they were finding like a gel like substance in their lungs after doing this repeated dives. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, there's um, potential for edema. So there's yeah. potential for for like a. They're not sure if it's to do with the blood shift, where the where the lung volume shrinks, it causes all of the blood to draw to the tissue around the lungs, and that then you end up with a kind of a movement of of plasma across. So they can, if they if they scan you on an ultrasound after you've done a deep dive, they can see some marker mm -hmm. that yeah. might not have been there before, but it fades away very very quickly, and they think that that is um, potentially you know just a natural consequence of deep free diving but the um the lung barotraumas are uh, are something that are to be taken really seriously i think yeah, they're not um, yeah. and and i guess now that there are you know like saying that th this is happening more often and that free divers are starting to experience dcs um it's because there are so many more people diving extremely deep like you know we have mm -hmm. whereas it used to be limited to just like a I think when I started, there was maybe one or two people that had been below 100 meters, and now it's quite common. Yeah, which is like it's a real thing, isn't it? So I guess statistically, things are going to change as well um, in terms of of the of the the problems around and that. I suppose too. with technology, with fins and suits and things, make it easier to soon mm. get down and be quicker. I guess. Oh, definitely. I mean, like when I when I started, there were no ladies cut free dive suits none and i remember like having to try and squeeze into a, a man's suit that's going to be like massive around the shoulders and the neck and like you can't get your bottom into it <laughs> it was just hopeless they didn't make fins for people with less than a size seven foot which is like most women have smaller yeah. than that so like i think you know and that's just the basics that really is just the basics so now definitely the um the, the equipment has changed remarkably mm. and and it is and it is definitely helpful yeah. yeah this episode is brought to you by narked at 90 the cutting edge pioneers in the world of diving equipment meet the founders john routley and brent hudson who have logged thousands of mixed gas dives over the past three decades about 20 years ago these experienced technical divers combined their passion for diving and engineering skills to create narked at 90 whether you're new to diving and ready to take it up a notch, have a fair amount of experience, or are considering a transition into technical diving, we highly recommend Narked at 90. They're ready to advise on the best equipment and set up for your personal and commercial needs. Narked at 90 also has extensive hands-on experience with Shearwater and Ratio Dive Computers, being the longest serving UK service centre for these brands. They're ready to offer technical support, servicing, repairs and upgrades for all Shearwater and Ratio computers past and present. In addition to Shearwater and Ratio, Narked at 90 stocks and supports many other brands such as Divesoft, JJCCR, Hollis, Revo and Kiss Rebreathers. The diving community is always enthusiastic about Narked at 90 and it's easy to see why. Here are just a few reasons full head servicing for rebreathers from various manufacturers, bespoke cable assemblies, advice on specific fitting requirements, suggestions and guidance for home builds, computer laser cutting and engraving, CNC milling and turning, pressure testing to simulate 400 meter dives. We're thrilled to partner with Narked at 90, a company that has ignited so much passion for diving and has been incredibly supportive and innovative in producing and selling dive equipment. Visit narkedat90.com to see why they're renowned name in diving. Stay updated on their insights and offers by following them on social media. Just search for Narked at 90 on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and hit that follow button. Yeah. So what's your discipline of free diving? Because obviously some people have a mono fin and then other people have like two fins and they're all different sort of class classes. Yeah. Um, I think one of my ambitions for the year was to try and compete in every discipline, which is, I guess, um, maybe that's a little more unusual because you, you start to see people specialize 
um, in competition in either the pool or in depth. And then around that, they then have their disciplines that they that they enjoy and they specialize in further. So I was kind of like thinking, right, I want to try and compete in all of them yeah. and train really broadly uh, just because it's like, you know, it's good practice, isn't it? So I think um, the discipline that I'm the most competitive in is a static apnea in the swimming pool. Um, and that's a timed breath hold. Um, I think this year I'm ranked in the top, top 10. I'm going to say top 10 because I'm not exactly sure what it is. And what length of time is that breath hold? Uh, my competitive hold for this year was 630 wow. something, 632 or something wow. like that. My, wow. my best ever was just over seven. So, um, but when you get a bit nervous, that sort of shortens things a bit. That's a um, long time. It's but incredible. The one that I enjoy the most is, is deep diving with a monofin on. I, I love it. I, it's really kind of um, because the swims are super easy with a monofin. They're really powerful. So it just allows you to kind of concentrate on your on your equalization and um, and just. Yeah. So I, so that that that's probably my favorite, I think. Yeah. And is it, do you feel like a, I suppose, like a fish <laughs> with like a monofin on? Like um, I think, I think fish look at us and go, oh my God, you can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> you always get the feeling that they feel a bit sorry for you. <laughs> or, fish or, the, or the mammals, I'm not sure. <laughs> kind of like, Where are yeah. your gills? <laughs> yeah. Where are your gills? <laughs> or, um, yeah. So, um I don't know. I think it's just um, it's just kind of the most efficient in terms of in terms of movement. But if you go exploring and and looking around reefs or or looking, you know, or or, or being in the water with wildlife, definitely having bifins on two fins mm. that's more manoeuvrable. So um, and obviously having a mask on helps to see because for the very deep stuff, we take the mask off to save the airspace. Oh, do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. There are very few people diving deep in a in a mask. Do you not have do you have goggles? Some people do, some people don't. But wow. because because as you know, as the pressure increases, the mask pushes against your face and you have to balance the air. Unlike scuba, where you can't kind of just <laughs> breathe yeah. out into it. it. You know, that that becomes quite a, a large airspace which is which is pretty valuable. So um so we do the deep dives without a mask on. Um, and, uh, some people really like the feeling of water on their face. Um, I find the, the, it's, it's good in warm water, but if you're in the cold, it's quite nice to have something that covers your eyes. So there are different types of, um, goggles that you can get that, are um, they're not like normal swimming goggles because obviously you can't equalize those, but mm. some of them are fluid filled and they've got corrective lenses in them wow. so that you can see perfectly clearly under we into a abyss abyss um technology i know it's mental isn't it it it's is really i've funny. never heard of that before that's incredible it, yeah they're oh, called fluid awesome. goggles but there's also some new ones around which are really cool they're like self-equalizing goggles so they have a kind of a, a membrane inside them um and a couple of little holes on the outside of the goggles so the water comes in and inflates the skin around your eyes so you the, the bit in front of your eyes stays dry so you can I've see i've never heard of this no. Really, really, like you're wearing a mask. No, it's, a... it's a new dimension to free diving. Yeah. Where are we going to have the really... mask that you, where you t you you have the fluid in your in your lungs, like uh, uh, in the in the movie? Oh no, 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 no. We're not, we're still no. We're not no. there. <laughs> That's like <laughs> James Cameron, if he's listening. You know, this oh, is here we go. No, we're not. We're not on liquid air just yet. But definitely having um, fluid filled goggles d d does make a difference yeah. to the. And the uh, people that don't wear goggles and have nothing, they're literally, they have a guide line down to. Yeah. Their, or, all, yeah. The, all the deep stuff happens with a, with a line down because um, otherwise you wouldn't know which way's up. Yeah. Um, and in terms of safety as well, you're tethered to that line so that, you know, then the lines are monitored with sonar or camera. And they have a lift type thing that shoots up. Uh, you're thinking of no limits diving, I guess, which is, um like the film the big blue yeah I don't know if you've seen it or not um they take a weighted sled down and then some sort of buoyancy device back up again i think that is a very 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 marginal side of freediving which 
the agencies that ratify the records are now no longer um, no longer looking at, at no limits diving because it's kind of it's not like Formula One where we've got tons of money pouring into the sport. People are building these mad contraptions in their garages and taking them into the water. Oh, to no. <laughs> so it's diving all over. It's like, <laughs> diving is full of mad people. Oh, it's, it's mad like the Wild West, isn't it? <laughs> but um, I mean, the... that's how free breathers came about. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, which really is terrifying when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, the deepest somebody's been on one of these contraptions, and I'm going to call it a contraption, is below 200 meters. Wow! I know, which is, but that's, I think once you start down. to, yeah, once you start relying on ropes and 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 systems that you you kind of can't swim back from, that no. it does get to another layer of of difficulty or, or danger in terms of the safety stuff. So that's like, that's really really marginal. And I think a lot of freedivers wouldn't consider that to be true freediving anyway, because you need to actually do some swimming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the years that you've been in the sport, have you seen, obviously you said there are more people coming into it, but is it through people seeing it happening? Because I didn't really know about free diving until scuba really, because and then they sort of come hand in hand as such because they're kind of linked. But have you found scuba divers are transferring over to free diving? I think the thing is, uh, we've talked a little bit about the competitive side of freediving here, which is like, you know, that that is people see see that and just think that is crazy. There's no way I want to do that. No, very few people come to freediving in order to lay face down in a swimming pool for as long as they possibly can <laughs> or dive below 200 meters. Most people come to it because they're interested in getting closer to wildlife mm. and um perhaps it free diving set up a little bit more like surfing or hiking or something like that mm. it doesn't have the same amount of kit or necessarily the same kind of logistics around it as scuba so um you can actually it's much more accessible you can you can get to explore and get pretty close to wildlife as well because you're not making any noise yeah. so whereas rebreather training is like really advanced stuff um free diving you can get pretty pretty close to wildlife without you know <laughs> and bubbles as well without blowing bubbles exactly yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's very quiet and and i think most people are interested in it from from the sort of exploration side of it and the deep stuff they kind of take it or leave it so but i think you know it's not until they start start the process that they think oh well that's actually really fun as well <laughs> you know so this is one of the reasons that it's um it's super important to take a course mm -hmm. and to do it safely and, and properly because um, it's not the same thing as, as, as snorkeling. And there are, you know, there are a lot of sort of safety systems in place that you, you need to understand. But I think we're seeing more and more, um, scuba divers sort of interested in switching over, if you know what I mean, not necessarily leaving diving behind, but yeah. interested in, in, in giving free diving a bit of a try as well. Yeah, I think we've had some scuba divers say it's helped them in terms yeah. of relaxation and air consumption when they go back to scuba diving. Is yeah. that yeah. something that you see? Oh, I think so. Yeah, because the, the breathing techniques are, are useful. And and as I said before, it's a lot to do with being calm and comfortable under the water. So that side of it is really going to with, help with scuba as well. Mm. Um, and I think also the equalization techniques that we learn as well can be pretty useful for for divers because every now and again you're going to come across scuba divers that really do find find it difficult to navigate um mm. equalization so and free diving goes into a lot more detail with with how to do that so it's you know i think there's um there's there's plenty of of like um plenty of things that complement each other and yeah. they're, they're both lovely sports but I feel like they're slightly different in terms of the things that you look at. When you're on scuba, you're very up close to things. So you can look at the kind of macro bits on the reef and you see things really up close and you can spend, you know, obviously you spend much more time down there. Whereas when you're free diving, you see, you see structures differently and you see the reef from a completely different, like a different landscape. Um, one of I was having an amazing conversation with one of our dive instructors down at Porthcarris and he was saying, you know, 
where the octopus lives underneath that kind of triangular rock to the left of the ledge. And, and I was like, actually, I, d I don't know which bit of the reef that you're talking about here. I, we're, we're kind of seeing things completely differently. And I was saying, yeah. is it in a cave? And he was going, what cave? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we do see it really, really differently. So I think it's, it's pretty nice to do, to do both. Yeah. 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 And then um, obviously free diving is maybe a little more inward looking yeah. as well. I think so, so where, where where does fitness come into all this because like if people come to you who want to learn do mm -hmm. you give them uh you know do they have to meet a certain fitness well i mean it we have the scuba divers and free divers have the same medical that you yeah. need to sort of sign sign self-certify on or, or or have signed by a doctor if you need to um, and they say that, you, you know, you, the ability to swim, and I think they use the same um, parameters as they would for, you know, an open water course. They, they say, you know, okay. you need to be comfortable swimming at least 200 metres. Yeah. yeah. That's the same for scuba, right? Yeah. You, they're kind of trying to make sure that everyone can swim before they <laughs> um, And I know there's a difference between being like a serious triathlete and being able to do the doggy paddle but um you know just to go down okay just can't come back up <laughs> but um no but i think like free diving as i said before it's one of those it's very self leveling so if you're if you're less fit and you need more time to sort of um work work out that stuff you just quite simply won't be down there for as long or as deep mm. um, but everything that you have to do around it is really really good for your health i think and you know the, it keeps you fit the, yeah. the training side of things so i think um it's and it's it's there's a lot more kind of inherent m movement than scuba yeah because, like, physically you have to move more yeah it, don't you yeah, yeah. Although the the load bearing side of things, I mean, I see people walking down a shingly beach in a twin set, and you just think, "Wow, that looks like really hard work." Yeah, yeah, see? lots of red faces in their dry suits. Yeah, definitely. Oh, twins, uh, twelves on their back. My goodness, it's heavy stuff, isn't it? And you know, when they're yeah. getting out of the water after the dive, and the you know the shingles all moving around under your feet, it looks like yeah, very hard work. yeah. yeah. But inherently, free diving involves much more sort of moving around and and, and swimming. So I think um, I think there's that sort of side of it. But mm. you know, they're both um, they both complement each other. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So down at Porth Kerris, um, what's your kind of season for free diving? Do you do it all year round? Or we do. Yeah, oh. I mean, I think the the courses book in mainly between middle of march and end of october so we've got quite a long season during the winter time it gets stormier and difficult to predict so you know when people are traveling across the country because they want to learn to to free dive in the sea and you just think oh well you know sorry the <laughs> storms <laughs> come in we have a we have a quarry that we can use which is absolutely beautiful um so we're kind of lucky in that regard um it, it's a nice plan B destination. But I think one of the things that we're um, big advocates of, and I'm sure you guys will appreciate this, that a lot of dive training in the UK takes place inland for yeah. obvious reasons. It's easier, it's yeah. more predictable, you don't have to worry about the weather, you kind of know what you're going to get. But I think in some ways people don't necessarily get to see the sea because yeah. of that and you know and it's so amazing down there i mean yeah. cornwall we're very lucky i think it's it's beautiful but really around the whole of the country we've got miles and miles and miles of beautiful coastline to explore yeah. and when it's uncooperative it's really difficult but when it's good i honestly think it's one of the best places in the world to dive it is i yeah. think yeah the teaching people to free dive in the sea is for us it's like um as much as going to the quarry is great and everything but like for us it's really like special to be able to to introduce people to the sport in in that environment because you know you don't get the you don't get the same kind of wildlife in a lake <laughs> no. <laughs> no and it's ever changing the sea isn't it with yeah current yeah. yeah what's coming in what's jellyfish floating by that sort of thing how do, how do you get on then if you because like for us winter time we'll be in dry suits 
We, so we go what suits you been a bit in? different to scuba suits. They're much, much warmer. <laughs> so um, we dive uh, all year round in um, in a five mil. That's enough. The this, the sessions might get a little bit shorter, but I mean, we we ran a course this weekend and we were in in for about an hour and a half on wow. Saturday. And I mean, I, I guess this what's is the water temperature? Um, we were in the sea on Saturday and it was 14 and then we were at the quarry on Sunday and it was 13. So it's kind of like this similar, but I mean, when the, the, we, the, the sea here doesn't really drop too much below about nine or 10, which, okay. is, which is very manageable. It's not, it's not like being in a quarry, which goes down to three or four. That is yeah. cold. Um, but no, I mean, the, the free dive suits that, uh, that have open cell linings are, are, are pretty warm so i mean we dive in them year round and i don't think i i wouldn't consider myself to be particularly tough or robust <laughs> when it comes to temperature <laughs> yeah i suppose it's more your hands isn't it and there the, the extremities get a bit chilly so. uh, yeah but i think one of the differences though is that on scuba you're really quite still so mm. you get cold yeah. whereas free diving you're moving around much more so that kind of generates a bit of True. you know lights yeah. the fire inside very true yeah. <laughs> but um yeah. we have a we have a lady uh, that works down at puff Keris teaching mermaid courses um, oh, really? yeah it's amazing she's so she's so much fun um but she's one of the most cold water adapted people that i've ever met she'll spend hours in the sea in nothing but a tail <laughs> it's just <laughs> like it's really amazing she's um I, I, think, I feel like she puts the rest of us to shame when we're like in our wetsuits with thick gloves and socks. And she's just like, oh, then what are you talking about? It's beautiful. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Oh well. Well, I th one day we will get there and do this. Well, I hope yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely on the wish list. Definitely. Think, yeah. Yeah. It will benefit us all. I think in different ways. And yeah. is 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 Honey thinking about coming as well? Yeah, yep. she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's uh she's up for all that sort of stuff anything in the water you know so uh, yeah especially where there's wildlife and uh yeah. you know uh lots you know nice clear waters and things yeah yeah she's right in, in up for anything like that yeah, yeah. waving at the fish is... yeah. <laughs> we're starting to see uh i think like the the younger generation coming through now um i have to say this it makes me sound really old but like we, we've got lots of um we've got lots of courses for younger teenagers running oh, right. um, nice. um and it's so much fun to you know to be introducing people new, new people to that side of it and we've got some like really amazing divers coming through that are the younger ones and yeah. it's it's, They've got it's no lovely. fear, have they? I think I think they're they're less likely to kind of push themselves though. They don't tend to dive with the same ego as an adult would have yeah. when they've got preconceptions about where they should be or mm. you know what I mean, or like I'm taking this course because I want to dive X deep or hold my breath for however long it is. Yeah. They're just kind of like much more visceral and they really enjoy being in the moment. So actually it makes them very good free divers. <laughs> if that makes sense so yeah it's been um it's been quite fun um it's been quite fun seeing that happen in the last couple of years i think it's 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 definitely becoming more accessible yeah. to the younger ones <laughs> so tell us about you know if people come down to yours uh what do people see you know for the first time well you know um because it, there could be people listening to this thinking about booking in for next year what would they see what you know what what's there well, one of the beautiful things about that is that you don't really know what's going to present itself. <laughs> I mean, in, um, in general, though, um, the way that we structure the entry level course is that you do a little bit of theory and then you get to grips with the equipment and the and the techniques in shallower water and wherever we can, as long as the conditions allow, we do that in the sea. So, um, you know, people people's first experience of it can be sort of, you know, seeing the the kelp and the and the beautiful seaweeds and you know surprising like really quite large rafts down there that you kind of think oh you know they've just they didn't they didn't see you or hear you coming so they're kind of like hanging about um and then on the second day we do a couple of dives in open water um and some of that does use a line 
and that line is there for safety so that people can get to grips with how to equalize deeper we're not just going to send them off into the gloom without you know without kind of like a sensible system. <laughs> see you later <laughs> see you later um but by the end of the um by the end of the course we try and make sure that everyone has a chance to explore as well so it's not just about line diving and it's not just about how long or how deep it's also to do with you know going to see the reef and looking after each other on on the reef yeah. so what you see like wow it can be it can be so mixed <laughs> i mean um we had one of the the mermaids last summer saying oh those octopus are a bit friendly aren't they <laughs> it was like wow that's amazing they were in their mermaid tails looking at looking at a free swimming octopus and wow. you just think, that's, the divers come down and they'll spend hours and hours searching for it and it's up at the other end of the beach with the mermaids. <laughs> but, um, it's not unusual to see, um, I don't know, we kind of have a have a little poke around and see what's underneath the rocks. You can see lobster and um, we, every now and again, if you're lucky, there can be sort of curious seals around. Um, when we're out on the boats, it's quite common to see dolphins passing yeah. by. And oh. sometimes they kind of come and check you out. So what are you guys doing? Oh. You, you can't swim very well. We're out of here. <laughs> but, um, you can sometimes hear them as well before you see them, which is really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that must be another sensation like scuba. You've always got that constant air. Mm. You, you, you're hearing your breath and you're hearing the bubbles go off to the surface. But with free wow. diving, is it you're just hearing the underwater noises, I guess? Yeah, which can be really, really different. So um, depending on where you dive, um, we were at a competition in the spring in Mexico in, inside the cenotes and they were so quiet, like there was no sound in there. But down in Cornwall, you get a kind of, um, you can hear the stones crunching around, you can hear, I think it's like the sound of fish on a reef, you know, it's like a kind of a nibbling going yeah. on. Um, you can sometimes hear boats that are a bit further away. Um, and every now and again, you get the sort of the noise of cetaceans, which is always like really incredible, but it's kind of can be quite short lived. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that one dive last summer, I heard a submarine. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, we, oh, I, was hanging, I was hanging down there hearing a beep, 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 but it was very faint. And I was like, that's behind you. It's his massive summary. It's behind you for sure. Just go, get out of the way. <laughs> no, it was like super faint. And the others were, I think I can hear it, but I could be imagining it. I'm not sure. <laughs> so like really one of the, one of the, I think one of the brilliant things about being in the ocean is that you never know what you're going to see down there. Yeah, really. Anything to turn yeah. up. Mm. Yeah, it can be anything. And it depends on the time of year slightly as well. I think um, it's quite nice in the wintertime diving here because you see more of the architecture of the rocks, um, whereas in the summertime there's a lot more seaweed. So it kind of it looks completely different at the, at the yeah. depending on the time of year. And then um, I think you get slightly different, um, slightly different marine life as well, um, mm. depending on the time of year. So yeah. So with free diving, when you're exploring, is do you have a buddy system as well? So you dive in, you always have somebody else with you or at the Definitely. surface? Absolutely, one hundred percent. This is like the most important rule of free diving is never ever dive on your own. Mm. Uh, you need to be diving with somebody that's qualified in how to rescue and that understand understands the safe, safety systems around it. So there's a kind of a they call it a one up one down system where one person's job is to look after the other person. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll both be on, you know, one person stays at the surface because um, you can dive down and meet them on the way up to make sure that they're okay. But um, chiefly one person is looking after the other person at all times. So um, you kind of take it in turns. Have you got so, a like float? Do you take like sort of one of these big floats with you? Yeah, definitely everywhere. <laughs> because I think, I think if you remember in the UK that you don't need a license to rent a powerboat in the sea that should give you a good reason yeah. to, to have some sort of surface marker boy. So yeah. even if it's not one of these great big free diving floats with all the, you know, all singing, all dancing, Flags. something to mark you out is yeah. super important because otherwise, you know. 
It's true. We were up at uh, Blakeney last summer. Yeah. And um, and usually when we go up there with our kayaks, um, there's very you might see the odd fishermen, but it's usually a couple hundred seals up there, you know, yeah. and um, uh, it's, it's huge for seals. And it's very remote, beautiful landscapes. And the first time, it was some holidays. It was quite early in the summer. It's good um, weather, wasn't it? It was really it was very nice. There was a group of people with um, jet, jet skis. skis. Mm. And they were going up one end and back down the other amongst the seals, full rate of knots. Uh, and we were, <laughs> we were like, worried in our yeah, kayaks, weren't we? Yeah. And honestly, and it's like you do. You're right. What you say, you know. There's people. You people do buy jet skis and boats and stuff. Got absolutely no clue at all yeah. about uh, you know being mindful of the water, about animals and humans in the water. Yeah, I think stuff like that just kind of. I hate hearing stories like that because mm. you know, yeah. It just, it just, it's, it's not just dangerous for us, but it's also dangerous for the wildlife as well. Yeah. And, you know, so many people are kind of like trying to get across the idea that there's a code of conduct around wildlife. And I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about seals or, or, or dolphins or anything. There is you a, know what there's... makes you, what, what grinds us though, is, is that the National Trust, oh, wow, um, yeah, the National <laughs> Trust <laughs> put loads of signs up saying kayakers, Stay away from the seals because you'll stress them out. Don't say nothing about the speedboats and the great big boats that take the paying oh, tourists wow. right into amongst all the seals. Nothing about them. That's but the, the anyone on a kayak apparently stresses out the seals. I was like, really? You yeah. sure about that? We get it every year, don't we? It's just I'm not sure. So uh, yeah, but yeah, it's really. Uh, it's super sad, isn't it? Yeah. It is. There's money that makes that go round, and that's the only so. only um explanation, I think. <laughs> it's good that you take a float in, and um, you know, with a marker, and you know, and uh, the buddy system. I, I like the idea. I like mm -hmm. the sound of that. It sounds good. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, free diving is a really, it's a really safe sport when it's conducted properly, yeah. and when people know what they're doing, and. I guess it's probably like anything like insanely dangerous if not but i think one of the things with freediving that i i often think about is like because people people see it as snorkeling plus if you if you had if you had never scuba dived before would you go and buy us a, a, a set a tank and a, a bcd and a regulator and get in without seeking any instruction no no, no. <laughs> like it's, it would be almost difficult to do that i mean i'm sure there are lots of deregulated places but if you're in a dive center they probably want to know that they're talking to a qualified diver before they're selling you any kit anyway yeah. because free diving is a little different to that i think there are lots of people that just go oh i'll, I'll go and give it a i'll go and give it a try and that's where we start to see problems because you really really do need to be with somebody in the water that knows what they're doing and yeah. it's very you know the the, the courses don't they don't cross the earth. You can, you can, even if it's just like an entry level course or a very, very basic certification, it just sets you on the right track in terms of, in terms of the safety systems. So at least then you don't know, you know, you know what you don't know kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So I think that's one of the things that we, you know, we're trying to kind of encourage with people. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And it's, it gives everybody a foundation. Yeah. Um, an appreciation of the water as well. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I've been um, uh, quite impressed with, um, I'm an SSI freediving instructor trainer. One of the, the campaigns that they have going on is, um, it's called a basic freediving instructor course that's directed at the dive pros, like scuba diver in professionals, so that they can, they can almost take the basic freediving as a specialty course that oh, then okay. allows them to teach basic freediving. And I think um, because it's it's not the same thing as snorkeling, um, there's, you know, but but if you look at the parameters of the snorkeling outline, you're able, I think the depth limitations are probably five meters or so. And, mm. and there's lots of, 
there's lots of the same skills going on in there, but this is sort of giving the the divers a, a chance to understand it from a free diving side. Yeah. yeah. Including yeah. the safety systems around it as well, which are which are different. They probably shouldn't be, but they are different to snorkeling. So I think one of the things that we've been seeing as well is that increasingly we're we're seeing dive pros that want to be able to offer basic free diving as well. And that's that's awesome to see, you know, it's mm. it's definitely growing and um, and and the and the premise is that you don't have to be like a deep competitive freediver in order to teach freediving to to beginners in in depth restricted environments. Yeah. And so it's it's a quite a nice way to to spread the word and to, and and really it's just about getting people um, getting people to come to it so that they can understand the safety systems and 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 go away and practice. You know, it's. Mm. Yeah, and it and it's spreading the kind of accessibility of being underwater. You don't you yeah. don't just have to be a scuba diver. You can be a snorkeler and you know a free diver as well. And hopefully, you know there are all these crossovers where people if they're free diving, they're going to try scuba and you know. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Um, we have quite a few of our of our customers that 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 do both. You know, mm. they, they might come down and take a scuba course at Porth Garris and then say, oh, look, at those, those free divers. I want to give that a try. And conversely, it works the other way around as well. A lot of the free divers like to like to learn how to scuba dive, too. So it's yeah. you know, yeah. it's just um, different sides of the same sport, really. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting. And yeah, again, you know, it, it's there for everybody to try and give a go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there places around the UK, like if somebody came and uh learn with you is there places around the uk that are say like the the places to go and free dive to, to tick off the list i think it slightly depends on what you're interested in because some people and it depends on where you live as well like yeah got quite a large community of free divers in the uk now a lot of it's pool based for obvious reasons mm. because if you live in a in a landlocked city somewhere that's the you know that's the the side of of things that people um you know th that you get the most time and and space with but that'd be just for training right just for training but people in that's kind of like a lot of people just really enjoy that and, yeah. and don't necessarily want to get into open water you know they they want to be able to sort of stay fit and and train in the pool and then we yeah. have people that are interested in mermaiding and they the the kind of like that's that's enough kind of thing like it so but then you know in terms of like the 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 kind of wish list destinations oh I, I just think there are so many of them <laughs> Where, um i'm not sure that i'm going to put any of the inland sites on my wish list because um, but they're more yeah, for training fun, really but they? yeah exactly for training but for adventuring oh as i was saying when we first um first started talking about the the trip that we did up to see Celtic Deep in Pembrokeshire yeah it's awesome like is this the one with the puffin hats yes <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant but they they also run trips out to see the blue sharks in the um you know and and the and the seals as well and they're really really knowledgeable in terms of the the wildlife mm. yeah well look them up definitely oh and definitely the puffin hats work they do. They, I mean, you have to kind of get your puffin decoy hat behaving as a puffin would. So um, you kind of like, you know, they actually sit on it, get it washing itself. Or, it's really what, some of the them sit on your head. On yeah. So you you have to be quite overweighted so that, you know, it's just the snorkel that sticks. Out. No. <laughs> and then you can kind of um, the puffins, though, they kind of come. Gemma around. needs to try this, don't you? <laughs> It's brilliant. It's I'll hold the camera. <laughs> yes, but we've been scuba diving and we've had birds. Like I remember, we were in Lundy. No, it wasn't Lundy. Was it? It's Farns. Farns. Yeah. And you were looking at me. And I'm going look behind you, and there's this bird underwater. <laughs> Whoa! Wow. What was it? Going... <laughs> yeah, but it's just incredible. We, that was just a whole new thing. Seeing a bird diving underwater, you think what? <laughs> yeah i'd never seen it before but they actually in a way they look kind of <laughs> poor puffins they look kind of silly when they fly like yeah they do. they're just like <laughs> and they don't look like 
I'm, you know, they look a bit silly, but under the water, they're amazing. They, they're almost like better swimmers than they are. Yeah. Than they are flyers, but it's really amazing watching them, watching them kind of catching, catching fish. And um, that was, that was such a fun trip. So I, I think that would be, um, yeah, that would be a really good, good place to, good place to recommend. Um, they also run trips down to, uh, to Lundy. Because okay. it's it's kind of equidistant between Cornwall and, and Pembrokeshire, I guess. It's like we, we were saying, well, we should meet up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think Scilly would be an amazing place to go and wow, visit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not sure about the scuba diving there. Um, I believe there are there are or, or there certainly used to be scuba centres out there, but um, I just think that looks like an amazingly beautiful. It's almost Mediterranean looking, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And the farms as well. I'd love to go up up, yeah. up there to, to see that. Yeah, because the underwater, um, you know, what you see underwater with the massive rocks is just such a, there's such a variation, even like a chisel, isn't it? There were, you know, seaweed and then the sandy patches. One of our last dives at the farms um, was um, so clear and... Um, that was me and honey and we were about three meters deep and the uh, she was like at first it was the second dive of the day and she was feeling tired and she said oh, i'll just want to get in for about 10 minutes you know and um we we jumped in and we were about three meters and we we're going through all these kelp and stuff and the floor was just alive with hermit crabs. You know, you shine your torch and all these critters are going, ah, you know, and, <laughs> and scurrying and everywhere. There's crabs, lobsters, anemones and oh, jellyfish everywhere, you know. And I said to her after about 15 minutes, so did you want to go up? No, no, no. She was <laughs> carrying on. And, and we, we were under for what? That was a long time. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the end, I think she was then starting to get cold, but it was absolutely full of life. And colourful, wasn't it, you said? And then people say to us, oh, I don't dive in the UK. Why I not? Know. I know. This is the thing. UK diving yeah. has a terrible reputation. And I I think that's because people spend too much time in quarries, actually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Get in the sea. It's amazing. It's not always easy, but it is, like, just, it's so well worth it. And I, I'm super lucky because i've managed to travel to some amazing places teaching scuba and competing in free diving takes you to some fantastic places and i always come back here and just think when it's good it is actually one of the best places in the world to dive yeah. it really is it's absolutely beautiful i love it <laughs> so i feel like we're very lucky we are yeah, yeah really definitely lucky. yeah no and i think you know it's really good to hear that from so many people that we've spoken to they are always yeah singing the praises of uk diving yeah yeah and free diving yeah so what have you got coming up you got any more competitions coming up What's going yeah on? um we're actually very lucky um going out to a competition in dominica in a few weeks oh, wow. time which will be really amazing there'll be some warm water there <laughs> um and then i think probably um Winter time it quietens down in terms of um, how many courses we're running, but yeah. we still we still keep diving and we've got an amazing community of people in Cornwall that are always always up for meeting up and you know it's um, we kind of like probably once a week even even through the winter as well, along with pool sessions as well to keep up with that side of things and and, yeah. that, and that kind of side of training to stay nice to stay fit and be able. That's to true. Fit. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. We try and do that ourselves and we book in with the pool once a month and mm -hmm. uh, especially because uh, it's good for us. Uh, it's good for honey, you know, being new because uh, so you soon, if you, if you, if you're not in the pool, if you're not in the water over winter, you can soon forget some of the basic skills and yeah. uh, you, you lose your scoop or your diving hat, you know, and um it's good to keep them skill the basic skills you know yeah it's familiarization fresh. with your kit as well isn't it about yeah. putting your regulator on and just going through the the steps of getting your kit prepared yeah absolutely and and also it's not that cold 
like, you know, <laughs> get in the sea. <laughs> I just think get in the sea as much as you can. Yeah. It's, you know, when the, weather, when the weather allows, just, you know, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And actually some of the nicest dives that I've done in the UK have been in the middle of winter. Really? Um, albeit they can be a little bit shorter. Yeah. You know, you can get some really, really good visibility days. Yeah. And, you know, you see, you see different aspects of, of the reef at this time of year as well, because once the autumn storms have passed, the seaweed's much shorter. And, and yeah, it's just like, just different, I think. But you get some good storms down there as well, don't you? Oh, yeah. Get some good storms everywhere, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but then it changes the underwater environment as well doesn't it so it's all it's all natural yeah yeah I mean I think it and it and it also doesn't take that long to clear up mm. I mean, we had a really big storm come through on uh Saturday night and Sunday morning which has just walloped the whole of the west of the UK and already today is looking quite nice out there another another tide and the visibility will have settled down and it yeah yeah so it's it's really kind of um yeah, I I just think it's it's lovely. Yeah, yeah. Well, hope... the weather in the winter, but yeah. make the best hope... we have the windows. <laughs> Hopefully, some listeners will be inspired by um, what you've um, said, and yeah, give free drive diving a go. So, if people want to get a hold of you, where's the best place for them to um, make contact, or how to make contact? Um, probably emails better because living down in Cornwall, there's phone signal is absolutely hopeless but you can find us at aquacity free diving um on the website or on social media as well and you can always contact Porth Caris to get hold of us too they're um you know so we we, we sort of we're neighbors we we live next door to each other and <laughs> um yeah so you can you can find us find us through both yeah well we'll put the show the links to um the website in the show notes so people can click on that oh that would be brilliant that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Right, we've got some set questions for you. Okay. And, uh, when we spoke to you on Little Big Chat, we didn't we do the questions, so it would be good to <laughs> fire these at you uh, and get your uh, get your answers on them. So um, one of the first things we, we like to know is, and, uh, is what gets you out of your comfort zone? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, at the moment... I'm doing a, this is very niche, but I'm doing an equalization instructor course. And some of the exercises on that are toe curlingly difficult. So that's definitely outside of the comfort zone. Is that in the water or out the water? It's all dry. So it's, it's oh. like a lot you can, you can learn um, around it. So it's just wow. really, really useful. Very, very niche, but really useful. Um, but I, I mean, I think generally speaking um i i like to do the sort of challenging things around free diving um like the competitions and exploring yeah. places but i always feel like i'm so happy to be there that it doesn't really feel like it's massively outside of the comfort zone if you know what i mean because it's yeah. just it's like such an honor to be in the water with friends seeing all of these amazing places but i mean they are it's still a challenge but I think yeah. you have to kind of like keep an eye on the fact that um, you're doing these things because you want to and because it's it's fascinating. So you kind of come to it with a bit of curiosity and it and it doesn't feel stressful. Yeah. Yeah. No, good <laughs> answers. <Yeah. laughs> um, one of our other questions, if you could take three people under the water, who would you take? And they can be past, present. They don't have to be divers as such, but it's just the principle of taking three people underwater for an experience. I would love to take my mum. It's probably not going to happen because she doesn't really like swimming that much. <laughs> but I think she'd love she'd love the wildlife. She's a real animal lover, and I'd just love to take her to see. I think she'd she'd adore the seals and and you know and seeing what's down there. Um, anyone that can't swim without wanting to sound like I'm being a psychopath, <laughs> take people that can't swim into the water. If we're in imaginary land and that, that, that they could just come underwater for the experience without having any of the skill, anyone that can't swim, because I think you, you, there's an entire world down there that's just so beautiful and so important and so crucial. And I, I think like just anything that we can do to, to share that with people 
the better you know yeah. the, the, they'd start to understand the importance of first of all learning to swim and second of all about you know what lives in the oceans and how to look after it so i think that would be the i know that's not one person does that is that allowed we well, could choose another person as well <laughs> elvis elvis <laughs> <laughs> so there we go okay uh, that's good <laughs> and uh lastly we're going to give you a billboard and you can put anything you like on that billboard it can be a statement it can be a picture it can be a video it could be an image but it's going to be a message that you're going to give to that whole wide world what are you going to put on it and why that's a really difficult question but i think and, and I'm probably a little bit biased, but my husband, Dan, is a freediving photographer and videographer, and his work is absolutely beautiful. And I think that it encompasses, he takes a lot of photographs. He's a, he's, he's taking his pictures freediving. Yeah. And he takes a lot of pictures of freedivers doing their, doing their thing. And I think um, some of his work, I, I'd have a job choosing which picture, I'd have to consult with the boss on that one, but I think because it really shows the the connection between man and environment and you know and it's epically beautiful so yeah. i think it would be quite simple actually that that one of one of his one of his pictures would go onto my billboard <laughs> yeah okay. no that's good because some of the pictures that you've sent us and they're just incredible yeah what yeah. he captures yeah yeah we're we're very lucky that he um that he kind of he make he makes it look so beautiful down there but he's really like um he's really sort of capturing the spirit of um adventure i think with um you know what people are doing holding their breath underwater and yeah experience yeah. the world that way so showing it's possible yeah yeah, yeah. definitely that's good that's good yeah Oh, well, well, thank you very much for coming on to the Big Scuba podcast. It's been really interesting hearing your side of freediving. Yeah. yeah. Just... Well, thank you for having me. And I hope we get to see you next spring or summer for a... Yes, that would yes. be really good. Water. We'd like to, definitely. We could do yeah. a swap. How about... We could, I, you, I can take you freediving and you can give me a scuba review. We'll <laughs> 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 yeah. that one a dive together as well. <laughs> That yeah. <laughs> so you know, people that come down to do a free dive course can they is is the time after the course then to go scuba diving like another day yeah i mean it, it sort of depends on how much you want to do normally our entry level course is over a weekend but um it's always nice to because every, Porth Carris is an amazing resort you can sort of stay on site and and it's kind of got everything really and you know so you can Come start with the free diving and do the scuba afterwards. I think is yeah. the recommendation yeah. just from a safety, yeah. <laughs> safety yeah. standpoint. But um, yeah, it's really nice to be able to do both. Ah. Sounds yeah. good. Sounds a great place. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Well, yeah, we'll put all the links in the show notes so people can click and uh, carry on through and uh, find you and see what yeah. it's all about. But yeah, thank you very much. It's been really, really well, thanks good. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's been thank lovely you. to talk to you both. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay yeah so we'll um so we'll, we'll cut the recording there but we'll um be in touch when we bring the podcast out it's we do definitely because i'd love to be able to share it yeah lovely Thank that's you. great That'd be good. yeah so we, we um usually release every couple of weeks on a monday so we just had a podcast out this monday so it's likely to be two weeks time so, okay yeah. perfect so just good. just let uh, just send me a link and i'll, I'll um and we'll, i'd love to be able to share it yeah but it's been really, thank you so much for having me on it's been really nice to talk to you both no thanks for coming on yeah. and uh, hopefully yeah, we can do it next year yeah <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> <laughs> yes let's do it great okay well enjoy the rest of your evening and uh yeah just thank you thank you again it's been really really good really positive as well yeah <laughs> yeah cool thanks a lot okay cheers right. thank you bye bye, bye. Well, uh, we want to say uh, thank you to uh, Georgina coming on. And it just sounds awesome, doesn't it? It, sounds it does, amazing. yeah. And also her sort of outlook and her attitude is so positive, happy, relaxed. Yeah, and it um, shows smiling all the way through. I know. And, uh, so, great yeah. answers. Yeah, um, and also quite um, levelling. So anybody listening can understand what she was saying because sometimes we have spoken to free divers and it's got very 
technical, hasn't it? And into the physiology. Well, diving can be technical, can't it? Yeah. You know, technical diving. And, uh, you know, why Why would free diving be any different? You know, mm. people do get lost in the, in the, and do love the detail. Do, you know, tech divers generally love the detail and the, you know, working all out and the planning and things like that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, every, every, sport and niche of a sport has got its own technicalities i guess doesn't it yeah well it is and you know we should have people that want to push things because if it weren't mm. for people to push things we'd still be living in caves we would <laughs> you know so we you know it, it comes naturally to us as humans to go hey what's around the corner what's out there what's a little bit deeper mm. you know it's not for everybody you know no, and that um, is exactly it. Not everybody is going to be the same as us or the next person. Yeah. And as you said, you know, free diving uh, is a leveller because you do find your own level. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, that's going to come natural and you, you, you're restricted by uh, how much, as she said, how much you can equalise, how much air you can take. Yeah, you can see the difference slightly with diving because with diving, you've got your equipment, you know that you can breathe and, you know, you can be kind of feel pressured or pushed into or pushing your own limits because of your own ego. Whereas free diving is a little bit different, isn't it? You only have... Well, I'm sure there's egos involved in free Well, diving. we've seen films of it, haven't we? But yeah, equally, you are governed by your own breath. Yeah, because you are. And... Um... It's good that there's still, you know, an emphasis. It's, it's a social sport, so there's, so why would you want to do it on your own? I, yeah. I've done it with photographers with in diving because there'll be, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of dive dive underwater photographers who dive, mm. you know, uh, will go out on their own. You know, they've done all the courses to be self sufficient and have. Uh, redundancies and bailouts and all that sort of stuff so they can be underwater for yes yeah. in one little position waiting for that chance of a, a nudie branch to to turn up you know and or a mermaid, uh, or a mermaid you know <laughs> and it's great and but uh i think there, there's a there's a place for for free diving snorkeling and diving yeah and yeah. rebreathing you know because yeah. You, you get that. You think back to the quietness of when we were at Stony doing the uh, rebreather. Yes, it's uh, incredible. Yeah. You know, for anyone who hasn't tried that, I, I recommend it. You know, give Scott Ladiman a, uh, a call and oh. get on it, you know, because it, it just shows you how much quietness, you know, there is out there to listen. And you listen in. And how much noise you get f from the exhaust from an yeah. open circuit. Yeah. And, you know, we mean that seriously. If if you, you know, no intention of doing rebreather diving and taking it further, but to do a tri dive, it is, it, it's right. kind of expanding your appreciation and knowledge yeah. of the under underwater world. But what others do in the sport of diving? That's with full face mask. Uh, yeah. That, you know, that didn't quite give you.